it's okay. Për shëndetje gjithë dhe tash që jemi të frikë musafir, apo student, qëtër që du t'ja fillojmë së shpejti. Hajde, vazhdo nësë dhe shushë një që zimë, po e prejmë të. Këtër në e mirë si jemi... E vësi, da? Në rështë të apromojmë e këta tjerë të jenë online. Jo, i kanë nërë, një nërë, po. Por shkak se e në një akumë e vjetën të këshu një mësë përshkojnë. A do se gënë të shtu me kapacitet për të të mërë. Një një, si e si të gëmë. Më kështë e gjendë është e si kutë prasë të 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 të
So this is already being recorded, and we'll cut this part until we start. But uh, when we do a Google Hangout, it automatically records it. So. Okay. We have people in the back. I don't want to move my laptop because we have a lot of cables here, but there's people here. <laughs> oh, hey, guys. Hello. Hello. Here Hi. you go. Uh, all right, so we'll just wait a little more, and then we'll get going. We're waiting for the Innovation Center of Kosovo. Here we go. They're calling. Hello? Hey, Shabona. Uh, Uh, Morat Lincoln, Ahine. Was for choking at you. an email at Carney Mel, Spend it. Uh, two new kids at the point. I did a pet in a pet. Shko, 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 Ti thonë Gmail, ta me ta qënë invitation. Hajtë qëre apë? Qëre nga të asene dhe bëllë që është? Dhe shka duhet me të... Jo, po qëti me shpendet ICK, Kosova, për shkak se duhet me pasë në circle in order for you to join, apë këta. Nga lëta bëjë ad me shpendet ICK. Më qëre një email, kime marë të shpendet ICK, ok? Let's give it a try. Okay. I send you another invite. So see if you, you can see that. Okay. And that links to one, huh? Hajt më shmojnë apë, më shmojnë. E pja që i linku në mund këtë. Hajde, hinë me qëtën përve. Qushina me në cilin e me lëhina herë në fundit? Herë në fundit që e përbuma, e mërë me me cilin e ja? A mërë të korabit, a mërë me të korabit me i? Kur Petrus që atë lingu, që apë ndodhë? Po, më në nësë për qofë me ty që ke hi. A, po në shef neve? Jo, bërë. Oke. This one is a little bit tough. Në në shfak. Isak. Yes. It could be that the Google Hangout has limit us to four... Um, let's let's do this. The uh, ICK center, okay? Bitch uh, we're gonna have you guys only be on the view mode, okay? Korab. But we can we can listen, I guess, to you. Yeah. Is that okay? Korab, now let the chat to have it in view. Let me not pause. Let me not skip it. You're not going to promise telephone in there, huh? Chat chat, touch. Let me not pause it. Okay. Just watch it. Oh, well. Okay, let me let me give you this link and you can watch us, okay? At, at least. Spend the fuck then nas mum met potu, put in a shot name, okay? 
Ca zoc cu clicon și atlien ca până așa, ok? Și atunci tot de goba te... Shven... ICK Kosovo. E bună reply ce ati link. ICK Kosovo aici. Po, în YouTube, ta ce tot chemi înapă, ok? Haide, e fain bine, se pe fulloi, mă vreau. Ta ne dute, ne provoi mă nere. Hai, thanks, mă. Ok, I guess uh, we can keep going. Ok, let's keep going because I know Chris doesn't have a lot of time. <laughs> And uh, we have all the evening, man. So in our end, it's still the evening. Everybody is off from work. We got quite a bit of time in our end. So uh, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, uh, I'd like to... Uh, quickly pass the microphone to the Tirana Center, which is in another country, that's in Albania, and uh, the Executive Director of Washington Education in Albania. Uh, I'd like to, him to just introduce uh, the audience over there, I guess, uh, and uh, say some words before we move forward. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, thank you, Ridvan. Uh, for those that uh, don't uh, know me yet, because, I mean, I'm new, I guess, That's a new program that just has been launched in Albania. It's a rollout project, you know, that is has been uh, applied in Kosovo uh, last couple of months. And uh, what we're trying to do right now in Albania is uh, similar. I mean, somehow uh, follow the same steps that uh, that uh, Ridvan and uh, Kosovo guys have done with uh, improving education for the IT engineers. Uh, I mean, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, facilitate and basically host this uh, uh, seminar, uh, e-seminar uh, on future of computing in uh, in Albania because it's it's new for for Albanian audience, and I would like just to thank uh, Ridvan for uh, making us uh, possible to uh, chit chat in a way or another, or just uh, share the views what the top notch is gurus of US have to say about the future of computing. Uh, it's not that we're not that much developed, you know, but we belong to the countries that we're not pretty much uh, developed in that sense, and we believe that we will uh, get a lot of inputs and insights uh, when it comes to the specifics and uh, nature of, the, of this seminar will bring to us. As far as the audience, I have to admit that uh, I fairly know some of them here, you guys. Uh, there's one guy that I, I would like just to introduce, even though we cannot see him here. He's a 13-year-old kid that is pretty much uh, known in the Albanian audience, you know, because he has been uh, he has been very much active, you know, recently with uh, with his in some of the top uh, shows, you know, televised interviews that he basically has particular interest with uh, uh, computer engineering. Anyhow, so uh, the, we have a, a fairly a low turnout today. Uh, we are a country where uh, we're just a few miles away from the seashore, and I guess that's the reason why we don't have such a big uh, turnout. But anyhow, we hope that with this limited number of, of students and those that have interest in, uh, in the IT world, am I, am I, uh, am I basically to? Uh, taking too much of your time, though, uh, I want to cut it short. Uh, uh, here we are with with those people, students, mainly students from the IT world, and uh, we believe that uh, uh, the interest that we will have, we will join you with questions and, and concerns that we have, while, while Chris and other speakers will address to us. Thank you very much, and I wish you good luck. Thank you, Istok. Uh, thank you, and uh, it looks like uh, ICK from Kosovo just... Uh, joined in, so I'll just pass that for a couple of minutes, Sven, or whoever wants to take uh, uh, the word and uh, say something about the, the ICK. This is the Innovation Center of Kosovo, Chris. Okay. Uh, and I think they joined us. Sven, or anybody else from your side, please uh, feel free to introduce yourself. Turn off the mobile phone first. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, we are here about 20 people in this room, and we are ready to just follow you guys. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. 
together with you. Uh, I don't know the background of the audience. Some of them are part of our incubator tenants. Some of them are new guests coming from the first time in uh, Innovation Center. Didn't see most of them been uh, attending uh, our events or trainings. So when we listen to you, we'll talk to each other, and then if we have a question to three or four instructors, we'll write it down to the paper and uh, ask them. That's great. Thank you. OK, so one minute on uh, a statement about Washington education in Kosovo. We started this with two things in mind. One is to create software, software engineers so they can be outsourced to big corporations such as Microsoft, Amazon, EA Sports, etc. Uh, and the second one is to simulate entrepreneurship so these guys can build the next WhatsApp or the next Facebook. <laughs> but uh, they, they can a product like WhatsApp or Skype or any any product out there, hopefully in the next uh, two to three years, would come from Kosovo. This is the spirit that we're trying to build here in Kosovo and in Albania. So I just wanted to throw that in there, Chris, so you have that in mind. The all the you know, ambitions of these young people here that uh, they are so hungry for technology. And thank you so much for your time. So I'll pass it on to you to talk about the, the future of children's mobile games and. Uh, I think you changed the title a little bit, so I'll just leave that up to you. So, Chris, it's all you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ruben, let me, let me, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just speak to the camera for a second, introduce myself, and then I'll share my screen. So, uh, everyone, my name is Chris Harden. Thank you for having me. I'm, in, I'm excited to uh, spend this uh, next hour with you. Um, I uh, spend a little time in electronic arts, and I'll go over some of my history. So, today I'm going to talk with you about game development at the level of a triple A title, the kind of game development that companies like EA create. I'll also talk about game development uh, for a small shop because I'm also doing that as well. And that should give you some insight as to uh, what you might be signing yourself up for if you want to do game development. I'm also going to look at the mobile landscape because it's easier to get into mobile than it is to get into console development. So you, you guys may be, some of you in the room have already started some mobile development, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So let me, let me go ahead and um, share my screen, and, I'll, and I'll, uh, we'll go from there. All right, so um, again, my name is Chris Harden. I'm a former Electronic Arts Development Director. Ridvan, can you see the screen okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I worked at EA up until one month ago. I've now left EA, and I'm founding a company called Trobo, the Storytelling Robot, and I'll speak a little bit about that in a moment. So uh, I'm going to talk with you about who I am so you know you know, why, it's, why you care to listen to me, why I think I have some knowledge to share with you. I'll talk about building games, again, AAA titles, which is what we call them, uh, from companies like EA and Activision, and then B, B titles, which is like smaller studios. And we'll go over things like architectures, best practices, the kind of staff you need. Um, then I'll transition and talk a little bit about the mobile landscape, again, is, is if you want to... Uh, Chris, yep. just know the slides are not uh, flipping, so I guess you might want to keep it not on the play mode, but inside the PowerPoint. I'm not flipping them yet. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> just so you have... Do you see the summary slide? As we are, yeah, we are on the first slide right now. Is the, What do you see on the first slide? Building, build. Yeah, build. I... Okay, yeah. Building. That's where I'm at. Okay, great. But you're right. Redvain, stop me at any time if you if uh, if you are concerned. Sure. Uh, we'll also talk about really briefly the future of mobile connected toys, which is which is what Trobo is, and then I'll open it up for questions. Uh, I think if you guys want, you want to ask questions along the way, you're certainly welcome to do that. You're also welcome to hold your questions till the end. This is fairly informal, so. Okay, I've now changed over to my the first of my Who Am I slides. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from a school in the U.S. called Auburn University. I also have a master's in business administration 
from a different school called the University of South Florida. Okay, I have Chris, a couple, yep. So I think you're in the play mode, and it looks like Google Hangout doesn't capture the play mode. So if you just, uh, I guess, go through the slides within PowerPoint. Okay, I've now exited the play mode. Can you see the who am I yes. screen? Now, now we can see the switch, yes. Okay, great. All right, so um, I, have, I have a couple of years of experience in industrial design, which is drawing cars, drawing user interfaces, products, making them look pretty. Uh, but the body of my career has been in software development. I've worked in embedded systems for the most part, so not, not Windows computers or Apple computers, but embedded systems that have microcontrollers. I've done a lot of mobile development as well. And I also have a fairly creative side. I've been a comic book illustrator and had some decent success as an inker for uh, Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Image, and, and a company called Top Cow here in the U.S. Um, and I also have a, an entrepreneurial streak. I've launched or I've supported about six different startups over the years, with, with Trobo being my next startup. Okay, so let's talk about the most recent stuff. Electronic Arts is where I've been for the past couple of years. I managed a central technology team uh, called Ignite, and I was part of a larger initiative called Ignite. You guys can look up Ignite on Google. But I, own, I manage the team for user interfaces, again, because most of my, I say, I say the last half of my career has been in user interfaces. And uh, if you, uh, the user interface of a video game is all the menus, the buttons, any sort of text on the screen that is providing status. So if you, if you play something like FIFA um, or maybe UFC or any sort of game, Battlefield 4, whatever console game or mobile game you might be interested in, um, anytime you have to input data, choose menu options, uh, you have to you get status like you just you just won something. All that information is part of the user interface. So that's the team I managed, and we manage a technology stack that is used by all of the sports teams. We have a couple of different stacks, and we'll, we'll I'll do some technical diagrams here in a moment to explain that a little further. But these games here, UFC, FIFA World, and uh, and NHL. Um, they have shipped, or they are shipping this year, with the technology, the new technology that we've been, that we've uh, uh, made available to those game teams. And that technology just happens to be Flash and uh, Action Script for those of you who are interested in the UI space. Before that, um, I've helped to launch um, several really cool products. Actually, Ridvan um, was a part of a couple of these initiatives. Uh, I'm not sure about the Kindle Fire, but Redvan was also a part of the Ford Sync system, which is this, uh, which is an infotainment system here uh, for the Ford company, and also the Coca-Cola Freestyle machine. And Stephen Yi, uh, who is Redvan's business partner with Edu on Go, you guys may know Stephen. Uh, these were all Stephen's project. He man he directed all of these projects with us. So, uh, so he's been a part of some really cool consumer product launches, and uh, that was always a lot of fun. Um, other user interfaces and other systems I've worked on. This is the last slide about me. I've also been in the theme park industry. I've worked uh, installing equipment into Disney theme parks like Epcot Center and Universal Studios theme parks and a bunch of other stuff that's not nearly as cool. By the way, Chris lives in Florida. So we have three different speakers in three different states in the U.S. Imagine the day when we get to do this from the moon. That's right. <laughs> I don't know how the sound will come, but that's right. Um, so the first thing, the real, the, the crux of my presentation and the conversation today is around game development. Um, Ridvan and, and Stephen felt like that would be probably the most interesting thing. Either if you're not really a big gamer, you might still be interested in how they work, or if you are interested in developing games, you can see what it looks like to the, to, to work on a huge, a huge, huge title, multiple million dollar development effort. So what I'm showing you here is the architecture that I've seen for sports games. It's just a generic architecture, but uh, FIFA Soccer, UFC, the, 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 again, the wrestling game we just released uh, with Bruce Lee, and even games like Battlefield 4, uh, Real Racing, all those console games that are on Xbox, on Playstations, no matter what generation you're really looking at, uh, whether they're the last round of the, the Gen 4 units, 
or, or before, Wii units, um, even mobile games that are really heavy, heavy games have a lot of this architecture. So I'm going to walk across this diagram and talk about each piece just so you have a sense of uh, what it means. That all these pieces generally have different teams working on them and, uh, and it gives you a sense of the enormity of a team. So the first, I, I, because I'm a UI person, I tend to think of the UI as the top layer, it's the user experience, the user sees all this stuff. So there's a UI layer and there's an associated user interface technology. For any of you who've done some development for the web or mobile devices, that, that can either be HTML and CSS, it can be Flash, it can be native, C++, it can be Java. It's just the UI layer itself is a, a heavy, heavy piece of work that oftentimes people don't really appreciate how much work goes in it to make a good user experience. Um, just below that, there's a data abstraction layer. So when you're playing a video game, um, like FIFA, for example, and user statistics need to be shown as you're choosing the players on your team or when you score a goal or whatever all that is just data that needs to be shown on the UI layer and historically companies make a mistake of having that data inside the user interface technology layer um, they might not localize it meaning they may not make it easy to translate it into different languages it, the UI layer knows too much about it and what happens is all this data floating up in that layer makes it really difficult to change the user interface technology to something new. Um, if you need to, as the technologies get old, we always have to replace them with some new technology. And frankly, that's really true for all these modules in this, in this diagram here. Um, just technology as it gets old. You get faster and faster with better languages, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the biggest problems that we ran into regularly, we and EA is still running into this problem, is migrating your current content to new technology. And one way that companies attempt to solve this problem is to have this data abstraction layer. So what I've drawn here is a little section where the game logic is directly connected to the UI layer and also a section where it's abstracted. So if you're thinking about building a game, make sure that you, you put a layer in the middle so the UI doesn't know anything about the data that the game is dealing with and that'll save you some headaches in the long run. I, I put a little arrow here that says not good because even EA, one of the, the one, if not the biggest, one of the biggest game companies in the world struggles with this. So it's not a trivial problem. Chris, can I stop you one second on a question on that? So if you have teams working on these layers as separate entity, are you saying that UI layer can easily be switched with different technology like from Flash to HTML5 or any other UI kind of technology on top of it? Uh, the, technology, the technology itself can be, the framework can. That's actually relatively straightforward. Switching okay. from Flash to HTML, rendering, uh, as long as you, have the, you already have the technology stack, it's actually straightforward. You can put a, few, a couple engineers on it and have the technology stack changed over within a month's time or less. The hard part, though, is all that content. So, uh, for example, if you build a menu, um, you know that allows you to choose your FIFA players for your for your for your team. Okay. There's there's PNGs, there's artwork that's in there, there's fonts, and all that stuff. If it's not abstracted, let's say that um, instead of putting all that stuff that uh, a layout file, instead of instead of putting references to all those media uh, pieces into a layout file like a JSON or an XML layout file that can be generically read by any technology. If instead you say, you know what, I'm just going to put this in an action script file. It's easier. I, can, I know where the files are on the file system. Let me just put my bitmaps here and I'm going to use direct paths inside my action script file. I'm going to load it up. I'm going to do all my styling for my fonts, the colors, the bold, the size of the font, all that stuff. I'm going to do all that, my animation effects, I'm going to do all that in ActionScript. As opposed to, I'm going to do all of that in a JSON file or an XML file that's abstracted and then interpreted and loaded. Then you get yourself in trouble a few years down the line because now you're, you're, you're dependent completely on the technology stack. But if it's all in an abstracted file, then you can load up XML either with Flash, you can load it up with... Uh, with HTML technologies, it doesn't matter. So that's what we mean by data abstraction. Is that is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is a very cool diagram. We're going to keep that here 
and the next time we build a game here in, in WEC and WEA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Um, so on top of that, every 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 user experience, whether it was the Coca-Cola Freestyle Machine that I showed you guys earlier, the Ford Sync system, any of these games, they have states. And if, and if you guys have done any sort of development, you know about state machines. So games are no different. In fact, games can, be ha can have really complex state machines or navigation systems, which is here in green if you guys can see that. Um, so we have the EA is a large company. We are currently merging two organizations, the, the Battlefield organization and the sports organization, and they have two different navigation systems, and we have to figure out how to make them play together, figure out how to, you know, if one's better than the other because they're different feature sets, they've been developed for different games, which one is better. But in the end, a game needs to say, it needs to know where the user is. Is the user setting things up? Is the user playing a game? Has the user just scored a goal and we need to show a special screen? Is the user going to sell his players or her players online for new players, which is a part of the, uh, the uh, FIFA Ultimate Team mode, which is a pretty good moneymaker for FIFA. All those are different gaming modes, and the navigation system needs to know the state that you're in at this very moment because it makes the game... Um, it makes the game act differently based on the state that it's in, and you have to be able to navigate. So navigation systems can be really powerful or really painful if they're not done well. Now the stuff in red, I put two things in red, the game logic, and I'll talk about the 3D and 2D rendering. Those are where the, the game team steps up, that's where they shine. That's also where if the game doesn't have enough features, so there's a company called Metacritic. If you go out on Google and you look up Metacritic, you can see that games like the ones that EA publish are rated. And if your game is rated poorly on Metacritic, you know, it's a 0 to 100 scale, and you get a 50, people are going to look at that and they don't want to buy your game. That's because you don't have enough features or it's unstable, whatever. So the game logic here is, is where the game team really earns their, their bread and butter. This is where they build everything in, the, 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 the play flow when you're actually using your controller is awesome uh, or not. Even a mobile game, the same way. You have to have that game logic. You have to know what game modes are. So game modes, just to talk about that, um, uh, on most of our sports titles, you have the basic playing where you're playing locally. You're playing against the computer. You have a game mode where you're playing against other people online. You have a mode where you, as I mentioned earlier, you're selling players back and forth. All these are different game modes. There's even a, a career mode where you manage your coach and, and the coach's teams over decades of time. So it just depends on what product you're using, whether it's FIFA or, or Madden, which is the American football game or whatever, as to what game mode the company makes available. But those game modes come and go. They, they're based on whether or not uh, game players, you guys, uh, like the game modes or not, and if you do, then they keep adding more savvy to the game modes, and if not, then they get rid of them and find a new game mode. So that's a, a big part of game play is figuring out what kind of mode is going on. Um, user set up the same thing, the first time flow. If, if, uh, if you've worked in gaming, you'll hear about the first time flow. It basically means I put in the, the, the disc in my, in my console game, or I've downloaded my mobile app and I'm starting to set things up and really I just want to get in and play the game. I don't want to have a whole lot of stuff between me and actually playing the game. So there's this user ex there's user experience, uh, excuse me, there's user setup experience or the first time flow. So there's a lot of work put into, hey, what is the first first person what is the first thing the person sees when they're trying to play this game and what do they want to do? So uh, that's a pretty pretty heavy user experience piece of work. All of these games, um, at the EA Sports model, I'll put it this way, is a very modular system. So all these different pieces here are modules that can be used or not be used based on what the game team wants to do. And so they usually have event systems that fire off events to different portions of the game logic. And for example, um, I, I, it was hard for me to draw it here, but audio, which is its own separate system, has events. The user interface system has events. It's either listening for events coming up from the game logic, and the game logic says, okay, something really cool has happened. We just scored a goal. Oh, someone just broke their shin. Um, I need to tell you about that. 
And so he fires off events to the UI layer, and the UI says, oh, oh, someone just broke their leg. Or perhaps it fires off an event to the audio system, and the crowd goes, boo, whoa. So all of these things are really smart. And that's because they have you know, a ton of engineers behind them building some really nice savvy. And the way they communicate with each other is event systems. If you've ever done any flash development or other development, you know what basically an event system is. Uh, technologies like Flash or whatever, they, they bring that to the table. They have events built in. Um, but game development companies like EA usually spend their own systems and make their own really savvy, complex systems. And just to talk about audio a minute, the audio system for sports games is really complex and a lot more interesting to work on than, say, the audio system for a game like Battlefield 4. And here's why. Battlefield 4, you know, you got bombs going off, there's some exciting music in the background and helicopters and all this kind of stuff, and it's a fairly intelligent system. But the audio system, on the other hand, for a, a game like soccer, like FIFA, um, the crowd has to know what's going on in the game. They have to know when to cheer. The, the audio announcers who are talking about the game in the background, the commentators, have to know what to say about the players. So it's a much more complex scenario depending on what game you're playing. And and I, so, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, quick question. So would FIFA outsource or get vendors for each layer? Can these be separate entities where uh, groups of developers can work separate on this? Or is this all in-house developers and everybody has to work with each other? It really depends. So, uh, for example, FIFA um, and most of the most of the game teams outsource a lot of the content development around building models, building the characters, even down to building the uniforms and the soccer balls. So all of the art is, is heavily outsourced. It goes to a variety of countries. But there's a huge art group that manages getting all that stuff built. Um, the artificial intelligence, audio system, some of the core value development is not outsourced. That, that EA considers a lot of that stuff to be its IP and they have, they, they're have they very protective, like they should be, of core value IP. Same thing is true for rendering. They're, they have some of the best engineers in the country, or excuse me, in the country, I think that's true, but in their company um, working right here in this hot spot in rendering because it's so critical to everything else. But like the UI stuff, for example, UI, um, the central team technology is in-house, but a lot of the UI work is all outsourced. Uh, we have companies in uh, um, Argentina, Romania, uh, in, in Canada, sometimes it's insourced in Canada, um, in, in some areas in China. So it depends on what the companies, what, what each studio's business model is as to what they're willing to ab, out, uh, outsource. Got it. Hopefully we'll have one in Albania and Kosovo in the future. They may. I mean, you know, how far away is Romania from Kosovo or vice versa? Uh, very close. I think it's one hour of plane or less. Okay. So, you yeah. know, yeah, they're very comfortable with outsourcing to, uh, to uh, um, um, uh, Romania. I mean, Romania is a part of the company now, but there's also a company called Spirasoft. You could look up Spirasoft and see where they're located. But okay. EA, EA is very comfortable with that kind of thing. And building relationships, you can... You can reach out. They have a central outsourcing relationship. I think I introduced Stephen. To, I know I introduced Stephen. I, Redman, I can't remember if you if you were part of that conversation or not. But Stephen and he he knows he knows how to get in and speak to those guys too. So yeah, awesome. Okay, okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, artificial intelligence. So we'll kind of move ahead. This is the, again the heftiest slide. But artificial intelligence is really how the uh, players are reacting to you. Are they really hard on you? Are they savvy enough to, to, to block your kicks? On the UFC game, you know, if you're a brand new user, the artificial intelligence is smart enough to go, hey, I'm not going to beat you up so much and, and put you on the mat. I want you to feel good about playing the game. And then as you become more of an expert, I'll be harder on you and play harder moves on you. Um, animation rigging is a big piece of work. So people who know Maya will go in, they'll build the, ro they'll build the models, and then there's a rigging group and an animation group that will put it all together um, you know, there's motion capture studios for football players. They'll go in, they'll do kicks. Golfers will go in and do their golf swings, and they'll capture all these natural human motions via a motion capture studio, and then they'll put those animations onto the rigs, onto the character rigs that have been built in Maya. And, and basically what's going on there is there's a, an animation 
framework that's intelligent enough that says, oh, this guy just got tackled, like in American football. He needs to fall down, and he's going to fall like this. So let me play this animation for when this guy gets tackled from this direction and gets hit in the hip. What about uh, 3D Studio Max? Because I know ICK uh, has some good 3D Max artists. Does, do they use 3D Max at all or no? Some do, yeah, yes. Yeah. Studio Max is fine. Maya is another one. In the end, they get it out to a generic format. Okay. Uh, Maya, I'll tell you, Maya is, I think, a little more popular, at least at the sports studio. I don't know, uh, but I know Studio Max does come up from time to time. All right. Um, lastly, a couple things here. A big part of gameplay these days is back end. So going out to servers, synchronizing your game with other players. So if you're playing, a, you know, against somebody on a server somewhere, there's a lot of back end work to make sure that is synchronized and you don't kick a goal and the other fellow doesn't know you kicked a goal, for example. So multiplayer stuff, infield debugging when there's problems, error tracking, validating your account. So if you have an account with Origin, which is which is their online servers for 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 um, downloadable content, social interactions, posting your your latest goal to Facebook or whatever, all that stuff is a hefty hefty team behind making sure that stuff works. And then um, HUD, so that's a um, heads up display. Basically, it's it's user interface stuff that's inside the game. So in a game like like uh, FIFA, the the scoreboard has information on it. That's all done in 3D inside the game. It's not done on the UI layer. Battlefield 4, all the stuff is in the HUD. And, uh, you know, you bring up your panel and you're choosing your guns or whatever, that kind of thing. And then finally, 3D and 2D rendering, you have to have some real gearhead engineers. If you don't, if you don't get an off-the-shelf rendering system and you're building your own, those guys have to be super sharp because they're making, they're making things fly at amazing frame rate, 60 frames per second. And, uh, that's a, a critical part of, of a game's experience. So now let's look at what it looks like for a B title. Uh, this is Trobo. It's a storytelling application. It runs. It's run currently built on Flash, and uh, it's a much smaller shop. So this is me and one other guy building this title. So we don't have as nearly a cool system as EA's AAA title and all that cool stuff they have. We effectively have one guy right now, and it might be a few more. As we, as we grow. In this case, we still have a UI layer. Okay. We still have some abstraction, but I'll be honest with you. I'm not practicing what I preach yet. I do have some logic that I shouldn't have up in the UI layer, but we're going to be changing that. I have a very basic linear state machine. It goes left and right, and there's going to be more states dealing with user, setting up a user and that kind of stuff, but it's nowhere near as complex as something like a AAA title. Our game logic is simple. We have some puzzles for kids. Uh, like this up here, they drag these little uh, uh, food items into a bowl, and you know, they're going to make a cake. Um, there's a basic event system for the user interface as, as they set up their avatars and they choose which robot they're going to go on the story with. Um, there's a basic event system for that. And then we have some back-end stuff, basically going to be around uh, story purchases, because this is a storytelling application, and parents can purchase more stories for their children. There's pretty straightforward audio. It just it, it pings whenever you drag and drop things, and it uh, um, plays a little background music. And then there's a text-to-speech library for the robot to talk and, and say things dynamically. Very basic 2D animation. Nothing really awesome there. This isn't rocket science. It's just flash animation. And the 2D rendering system is the flash player, so that I don't have to do anything there. So as you think about your game development, you still have to have a lot of this stuff but you'll find you can cut corners. You're not making a AAA title. You're making a B title, and you can choose what you need to put in. You also figure out, well, I can do some basic animation, and then later I can make the animations better if I, if I actually sell product. All right, let's talk about uh, game teams and central teams. As I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> all that stuff is modular. So uh, this is just to show how this may work. Again, it's an EA Sports model. Some other studios are very monolithic with their technology, which means you have to take it all or nothing. But but the better, more modular way to go is what sports follows. So we have a game team like FIFA, maybe Madden, maybe golf. And we have these different central teams, an audio team, a UI team, a telemetry team. All that stuff we looked up here, there are these central teams. And I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you uh, that diagram with central teams in just a moment. So each game 
product owner can say, yeah, you know what, or technical director can say, yeah, I'll take, I'll take the audio team and I'll take the uh, UI stuff or the telemetry stuff, but I don't want the UI stuff. I have my own stuff for that or it's just too hard to take it. And every few years they, they figure out whether they're going to take the latest and greatest technology. And they all have their own teams over here and, and the central teams provide their tech to all these game teams and then each game team developer is sitting on his or her game all day long making that stuff happen. So here's what it looks like. Uh, the generic diagram I just say, gave you. Here's an example of, of, of the generic of the, of the game team ownership versus the central team modules in color code. So blue, game team, they, they are supposed to handle the data abstraction. We provide a framework for that for the UI layer, but they actually have to do it. And, of course, they own the game logic, they own the artificial intelligence, because NBA, the basketball game, is a lot different with this intelligence than UFC, a lot different than, than FIFA, so on and so forth. Animation and rigging is the same way. There's some, some central stuff, but really the teams have to manage their own animation and their HUD. Central teams provide frameworks for UI, for navigation, and state machines for events. Back-end stuff is very centralized, audio, telemetry, and rendering. Okay, let's talk about a, uh, a game cycle. So this is, uh, again, with respect to EA Sports. Now, some companies, last their game development is two or three years. It takes them several years to bring out their game, like Battlefield, for example, um, or a recent release of um, a UFC took two years, NHL took two years, and uh, Plants vs. Zombies, they now have a, a, a first-person shooter game. Um, that Garden Warfare, that also takes several, took several years to get out the first time. But the sports teams actually release their games at the same time of the season start. So when, when, when soccer starts up, that's when we release this year's soccer game. But generically speaking, there's pre-production. In there, uh, storyboarding, uh, concept art, changes to the team, scheduling is done, tools, new tools for the year, all that stuff is is identified and ideally locked down during pre-production, which can be one to two months, maybe three months. Production is where we actually start developing the game. Art development is made, models, the, the 3D models are made. Ideally, the features are locked. Here's a little smiley face because that's not always true. Um, in the end, there can be a producer who walks in and says, yeah, we really have to have this product. We have to have this feature, otherwise we can't ship the game. So you guys figure out how to make that happen and, and then it, it starts pushing things out. Uh, then we go into this alpha phase as, as supposedly all the features are done. Uh, we do some internal betas, closed betas, and then alpha period. So in that ha during that period a lot of stuff is going on. Third party approvals, right? If you're shipping on Apple or on Xbox or on PlayStation, all those companies have to, have to sign off that yeah, we like what you got. Uh, bugs, bugs are burning down. Uh, reality is that not only are bugs burning down, but people are still adding features like they shouldn't. But I can tell you now, if you're interested in doing game development for a company like EA, you'd better be ready to do a lot of hours during Alpha. It can be several months, and it can be 70 and 80 hour weeks easily during this period. So if you have children, you might reconsider that. Um, Post-release, so here's the release. It gets out there. There's a, nowadays, a lot of the games, mobile or even the console games, it's all about, hey, how do we support this game afterwards? Web services support the team. So web, the web team now steps up and takes on all the server load. If you've ever seen an online game get really hurt because they launched and then they failed and the servers are going down, that's because the services team got surprised at how many people wanted to use the game. The guys that were over here burning hours, the production team, have now gone home, and then there's a few people around to fix critical bugs. And then after a few years, we sunset the game, and we retire the game, we retire the servers, because there's a new game that's better than that one. Okay, I'm going to kind of move quickly here, um, so we still have time for questions. Building games, you can. You guys will have a copy of the deck, I think. Red Man, you're going to share this out, right? Right, yeah, because it's not uh, that clear, because we're not, we don't have a big picture, but yeah, I'll share this afterwards, so we can okay. analyze this. Yeah. Okay, so here's some tips for you. If you don't know about Scrum, learn about Scrum. It's the software. It's the standard for developing software these days. Some tools. Handsoft and Jira are great for managing Scrum projects. They have their strengths and weaknesses. Handsoft is specifically targeted towards game development. If you're working in multiple locations, use things like Microsoft Link, GoToMeeting, and more importantly, if you're do, you make sure you do video chats with anybody that you are working with remotely. I cannot emphasize that enough. 
Audio doesn't do it. It's just not enough. You don't learn about their body language. Uh, you don't know if they understand stuff. Enforce video chatting. I really believe in that. I've highlighted tools, pipelines, and infrastructure. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Make sure you do code reviews. Code, collabor code collaborators are a great tool for code reviews, so check that out. That's what we use at EA. Love that product. Make sure you do user trials and betas. You can do that on the mobile space with Hockey App and Test Flight. Um, make sure you do QA and QC. Don't blow that by. It's extremely important that you do quality control on your product. I don't care how small you are. If you don't do that, you're going to have a bad product. And, uh, and find bug, finally, bug tracking. Use Jira and Mantis. Those are both terrific for bug tracking. Let's talk about pipelines a minute. One of the big surprises that a company starting to develop a product, a mobile product or a game product, is that they don't realize how much work goes into processing the artwork from programs like Photoshop and Illustrator down to where it gets on the game. So these are just two pipeline screenshots or, or, or images I took from Google from a couple different companies to show you how complex it can be to get your artwork from the source down to the game. So make sure when you're planning your development cycle, you realize this is going to be a lot of work. And if you don't have an efficient pipeline effort, i.e., I export it from Photoshop, I put it into this directory. I run some scripts, and it lands in my game. All that stuff, the sizes, the quality, all that can be very expensive if you don't really work through that process. So plan to make sure you have a really streamlined pipeline. Uh, here's a quick staff listing. Um, program managers or development directors, producers essentially say what the game is going to do, development directors and, and program managers are, are the guys who execute on the plan, the producer is responsible for what the game looks like and the features that are in it, technical directors, Red Van, I realize that I just put acronyms in here, I will go back after this presentation is over and spell these out and send you an updated deck. Okay. Um, no. So. The technical directors are in charge of, of technically making sure that the game works. They are the engineering managers. Technical artists are oftentimes more used than regular artists. They are technically savvy in something like 3D Studio or Maya, and uh, but they also have the ability to do scripting, so they can do a little bit of both art and, and, and development. Actual development staff, quality assurance, marketing, finance, and legal, all of these go into making a game. Now, when you're down to a two-man shop, like me and my partner, we do it all, we just don't do as much. All right, let's quickly shift gears and look at the mobile landscape. Uh, I recommend you read a book called The Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. It talks about if you're trying to create a company, uh, the idea of getting innovators to adopt your stuff and then jumping over this lead to early adopters. It's a really cool book. It talks about the difficulties of getting your product into the hands of the masses. Uh, I will tell you that I believe there's still a lot of growth, growth in the mobile world. If you look at the, this is a, let me back up, this is a technology adoption life cycle. Some of you have seen it. I hope all of you have seen it. If not, you should become very familiar with that. No matter what, what field you're working in, if you're in this class, you should listen, you should learn about what this technology adoption life cycle is about. Cr critically important. Uh, these are adoption life cycles of some various technologies over the years, and it shows mobile space right up here starting. This, this deck's a couple of years old now. But I really believe that we're still in the um, early adoption stage of, of the mobile um, uh, life cycle. And this, I put a little website here. I encourage you to check it out. They talk about um, how mobile is being used by customers. So 30%, this is what this little chart is here. 32% of it is gaming, 8% is entertainment, and 6% of it is social. I added that all together to say roughly 46% of mobile on time, uh, of mobile usage is spent on social, entertainment, gaming kind of stuff. There's a lot of people out there just looking to, to spend their time having fun. Wow. So my CTO at EA Sports told me he felt like in the next five years, mobile processors will outpace the Gen 4 consoles that just shipped in power. I tend to agree with him. That means consoles are going to have a hard time staying relevant as mobile devices get more and more powerful. Uh, I think that means that there's still room to make money on mobile gaming. And here's the most important thing. If you want to get into gaming, I encourage you to look at mobile first. It's harder to get into a, to a large company like EA, but you can start making games yourself and learn about game mechanics and all that kind of stuff. You get your devices. It's easy to get a mobile device. a lot harder than to get, get 
than to get a development Xbox from Microsoft. And, um, and you can learn a lot about game mechanics and that kind of stuff in the mobile space. Uh, here's some mobile practices. If you are going to develop a game, go free to play. No doubt about it. Learn what free to play means. There's a lovely little article here. And learn that your spend your people that are going to be that you're targeting towards are whale spenders. Free to play means you give away a basic version of the game for free. You let people try it out, and then once they've become emotionally bonded to it, they will pay you for upgrades. So really important. I had to convince my partner that this was the way to go for mobile development. I really encourage you to investigate that before you decide to, to charge something right up front for your game. You need to build in social aspects. The ability to, to use a leaderboard is built into uh, Apple iOS applications. You can do leaderboards easily, provide Facebook logins, and know your business. Learn about App Annie. App Annie is a company. They provide general market statistics that you can watch. You can also pay for very specific statistics, acquisition, or AEM, uh, acquisition, monetization, I can't remember the E, engagement and monetization statistics. This is mobile mobile speak. You really should learn what AEM is about, and App Annie will help you do that. And pie in the sky, if you can put in your own telemetry to your game to figure out what your users are doing, I encourage you to do that too. This is usually the last thing that gets added. All right, real quick, one slide on the future of connected toys. If you guys haven't seen this stuff, it's pretty cool. Um, there's a movement to get real-world interaction with your mobile devices. Here is an augmented reality, reality application where these people have built wooden blocks. When the, when the wooden blocks appear in front of the camera, the, the application changes them into elements like um, mercury, carbon, and when you connect the elements together, they create molecules like water. So there's a cool a hyperlink about that. There's a product called Oobly, which is a, a stuffed animal with speech recognition in it. So the Oobly can listen to children. The children will tell it to do something, and it does it. It also has the ability to physically know the environment. So if you throw Oobly in the air, it says, Wee! So there's a lot of cool stuff with interactions there. Our product called Trobo has text to speech, so it knows the child's name, it reads stories to it, and the child can hug the robot. And the robot has a speaker inside of it that reads the app, reads the stories to the child. So there's a lot more uh, physical connection with the application, and the child is actually in the application as an avatar. So there's another connection, and it's all wireless and and real user friendly. So. You might look at this as a potential path. There's a lot of technologies out there that enable this. You don't just have to go with uh, with a uh, 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 strictly an app. You can also add some physical element to it. So there we are. I told you who I was. We talked about building games, looked at the mobile landscape. One thing I'll say before I open it up for questions, uh, we do have a Kickstarter project starting in September. It's a shameless plug here. If you know anybody in the U.S., we're, we're not shipping these internationally, but if you know anybody in the U.S., and you can help spread the word, then you can go to TroboKickstarter.com, sign up for our announcement, we're going to do Kickstarter. You can also kind of see how Kickstarter works if you want. So uh, let's open it up for questions. We, I guess I ran a little long. I'm sorry about that, Red Van. We can go as long as you need. Yeah, so we have uh, John going in 10 minutes. So I guess we got 10 minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, this was very interesting. Uh, we will definitely... We talk about all the slides here in WEC, and uh, I'll probably have another virtual event to go over some of the cool diagrams and see if they have any questions. But let me, uh, there's a list of questions here that I see, and people have posted on that course. Uh, so I'm going to just go and read out some of them, and uh, I don't know if we have time to answer all of them, but maybe we can do them by, you know, in written later. I can so, answer it. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I have a question here. Uh, hi, in what language did you program the Ignite engine? The Ignite engine is actually a large stack of a bunch of different technologies. Most of it is C++ uh, or C, depending on how low you go. Uh, the UI, the Ignite UI, is uh, Flash, ActionScript 2, ActionScript 3, running on a scale form. If you look, at, if you look up scale form, it's a uh, it's a, a competitor of Flash uh, from Adobe. It's from a company um, I can't remember the company's name, but you can look up Scaleform. So it's ActionScript 3 is the main language, and then there's there's Lua L U A. Check out Lua. It's a scripting language for gaming, 
and uh, and also XML and JSON. So that the UI layer is fairly abstracted, and it's got a bunch of different languages in it. Interesting. Cool. Is possible? Is it possible to create holographic game? If you want to play football in my room with Ronaldo or Messi, using holographic display, this is a dream. But could it be a real reality? That would be so awesome, right? Yeah. Um, I have we not all seen Messi and Ronaldo here. So if if they were here with in, in the room with us playing, that would be awesome. You know, I, I saw holog I saw holographics back when I was in high school, and for. Uh, for those of you who are too young to know this, I was in high school in 1992. So, uh, holographics, I don't know. They never took off. They were cool, but I never saw them really take off like I had hoped. I yeah. haven't heard anything about that. The only thing I've heard that's remotely close is the Oculus Rift. That was popular. It was growing in, in interest at EA. So you can look up the Oculus Rift, and you might be able to do something with that. But I have heard nothing on holographics. But I'm not an expert either, so... You can look it up and see if you can find something cooler. Cool. So that, that question was from Artan Ahmeti. The previous one was from uh, Christy Georgi from Albania. And let's skip a few, and then I'll go to Aisha, Aisha Klinaku. What do you think, what kind of effect will have will the mobile games and UI development to children in the future, uh, in particular education? Would they waste their time? I guess uh, what kind what kind of effect will have mobile games when it comes to education for the future you know for the future of kids is is it more towards being productive or waste of time? Well, to be honest with you, uh, I think it's a little both. Um, I'm as a father. I have a son. He's two and a half years old. My business partner has children, and um, you know my son does waste time on mobile apps right now. He watches YouTube mindless videos on YouTube. I can get him to watch some things that are counting and that kind of thing. But that's why we started Trobo is because we are trying to develop applications that teach children st uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. So if I have my way of the world, then the mobile apps will be used to to educate children, even, even toddlers, about technology so they can have careers in that area and actually learn something of value and not just watch mindless my, play mindless games and watch mindless shows. I think it'll be a little bit of both. I think that uh, the products that I showed you and some others that I haven't showed you will help and that's going to continue to grow. So if you have a passion for developing educational apps for children, I encourage you to drive that passion. Please give me something I can give my son. And uh, um, I still think that it comes down to the parents as well if parents are willing to give the right applications to their children. Well, I'll definitely get a trouble for my son, so we'll we'll test that out. Good, because he, he, he wastes a lot of time on other games on iPad. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, we have seven minutes to get ready for the next uh, topic. So we'd like to really appreciate your time uh, and thank you, Chris. This has been amazing. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some more of these uh, talks in the future. But thank you so much. We have a crowd here that you cannot see because I cannot move my monitor that much, but everybody's waving at you here. Uh, Thanks, guys. I appreciate your time. And, and uh, we have too. Oops. All right. Uh, Thank you so, so much, we, Chris. We'll talk. Uh, yes. Let me say that, uh, really, you can forward any of those questions. If you guys have questions afterwards, just send them all to me. You have my email address. I, I, if I didn't put it, I think I put it in the deck. It's chris at herecomestrobo.com. I'm happy to follow up on all those questions offline, okay? Yeah, we, we might uh, find some people to do a focus group for you if you need them. And if no, that sounds good. All right, thank you, Chris, again. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Me too, thanks. Uh, thank you. It's done. Yes. I wanted just to jump in since we were talking about uh, contacts and about uh, sharing information. I mean, um, obviously, there was it was it was something that uh, I was thrilled with uh, what we have listened so far, but. Is it possible that we have a, this PowerPoint presentation that we deliver to our uh, participants here once we are done so that they can have in their inbox, you know, whatever they have listened here, and they can basically process when they go back home, and, 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 and then perhaps they will have additional questions, you know, that we can address directly as well? Yes. Uh... Yeah, uh, Chris is going to revise uh, in a couple of places, and then... Uh... 
yeah. will uh, send everybody the maybe uh, another PowerPoint or a PDF version of that. Yeah, that that would be good. You know, at least a condensed version of what we have listened today. Okay, for the last the five minutes, Chris, it looks like uh, the ICK Center has some questions. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no I, worries. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so here we go. They're waving over there. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, by the way, because I muted you earlier. Okay. Go ahead. You hear us? Yes. Yep. Oh yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we have three questions here. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the guys here just wanted to ask you, how do you do in maths? How do I do what? In maths, mathematics. Mathematics. How much that math is involved, I guess, in. Uh... Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, math actually is 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 really important for uh, the the 3D rendering. And somewhat important for the UI layer. Uh, if you're doing things dynamically and you're moving things around, you have to have a sense of how things are laid out on the screen. You have to be able to do some fairly dynamic math. But I can tell you, you, you need to be really savvy in math if you want to work in th the 3D space. There's, okay. a, there's the animation. There's physics. There's a lot of physics. There's a whole physics engine. that I, now, that, now that you've asked the question, I forgot to mention, there's a huge physics engine that goes into these games too. Okay, thank you. And the second one is, uh, how was the transition from the embedded system to gaming? How was the transition from embedded systems to gaming? Yeah. Um, gaming, you know, it's funny. Back in the day, embedded consoles like Xboxes and PS4s were much more embedded than they are now. Consoles these days are... And even mobile devices like phones and stuff, they have real computer processes and processors in them. They're very powerful. In the embedded space, the truly embedded space, like the Ford system, the, the, the freestyle system we showed you earlier, anything that's small in your pocket that has some intelligence but isn't a real computer, the difference there is that you have limited RAM, a slow processor, um, and you just don't have a whole lot of room to move. Uh, but if you look at your computer for gaming, mobile devices these days, and in all the consoles, they are huge powerhouses, and you have so much more room to move. It's frankly a lot easier to do your job when you're developing in those spaces. The truly embedded space, you uh, you get to have a lot more fun making things work with really limited resources. Okay, thank you. And the last one is, what is the future of so-called serious games? Series games? Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. Uh, games used in education, for example. Oh, oh games, games for education? Yes. Uh, I, I believe that games for education are, they're going to do a, two, a couple things. One of the things I think they're going to do is what Ridvan has encouraged me to do, as well as other entrepreneurs using his platform is they're going to move online so that you can be connected from any device that you have and run it. Whether it's your iPad, your Android, your computer, whatever, it's all going to be in the cloud so that you can have a class and you can learn up there and you can retrieve it from any application. So I think a lot of the educational apps are going to have to be cloud-based somehow. And so I think, I think I commend Ridvan for his vision for the future with EU on Go. It's totally in the right space. Um, the other thing I think that uh, that, that educational apps are going to do, at least I hope, is is really reach out to children and hopefully teach technical topics, which is what I'm trying to do with Trobo, is to reach them really young because children are so smart. I have uh, some friends, their sons are uh, 6 and 10, and they are programming, programming Minecraft, if you guys know what Minecraft is. It's an online game. And they're using Eclipse, which is a free development environment. They're using Java, and they're saying words like class and instantiation, which is big boy words when you're talking software. And these kids are 6 and 10 years old. So I think children are becoming more and more programming savvy, and I think they're really going to surprise us with what they can do long term. So educational apps are going to have to be smart enough to keep up. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh uh, we have one minute. Actually, we are right on the spot for uh, inviting uh, John Hatch. Uh, Chris, thank you so much. We're going to have to jump into another uh, Google Hangout because this is a standalone recorded version. And uh, I don't know what's your schedule. 
Uh, but we can send you invites for the other speaker, Chris. Thanks, Ruben. I actually have to go. I have some other obligations. But you guys have a great time. It was nice to meet you all. All right. Thank you. Uh, is Chuck in there? Yeah, I, I had a couple of questions, you know, here, but I guess because of the time restrictions. Yeah, we have to switch we'll, to uh, the other one. We'll, we'll send all the questions, I guess, uh, via email, and uh, I'll communicate that to you guys. Okay. Uh, so, but I'd love to have maybe in the future another virtual session so we can go over these slides. The, they are very intuitive, very interesting, which uh, if you have any questions, I can answer those. Okay, I'll make sure that I, I address those questions to you. Okay, so we're going to hang up from this Google Hangout, and uh, you you shall receive another link for another Google Hangout, okay? Okay. All right, thank you, guys. <laughs>